being both in the late 60s it took her on this wild ride into the inner circles of these two amazing groups and what life was like with them please welcome to the stage miss chris odell Sorry, I have to sit down, otherwise I'd love to stand. And I will leave time for, uh, for questions, for anything else that, that you guys might want to ask. Here's our, here's our people. Chris, have you done a fest like this before? Is, is her mic on? Can you guys hear her? Let's, let's try it again. There you go. Hello. There you okay, are. Now I'm on. Okay. Welcome the, the to our welcome to our crazy dysfunctional family reunion. <laughs> I have not done a fest like this before, but everybody here has. <laughs> we we got some newbies here. You're you're amongst friends. You're Thank amongst you. friends you. and family. Derek Taylor is the one who brought you into the Beatle world. Would you explain how you how you wound up at Apple? Yeah, um, I was, I, I grew up in Tucson, and um, I had to get out of town. You know, it was the late mid-60s, and it was boring. So I moved to L.A., and I accidentally got a job at a record company there. Not a very good record company. It was Dart Records with Liberace and Lawrence Welk. But um, fortunately, that was my entree into the music business, totally by accident. And um, I met a promotion man from A&M Records who said, I want, who called me up one night and said, I want you to meet me at a restaurant because I want you to meet a man called Derek Taylor. He works for the Beatles. And I thought, no way. Nobody works for the Beatles. The Beatles are kind of like these fantasy people up here. And so I said no. And he kept telling me, no, 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 you've got to come. So... Finally, I decided, okay, it's better than sitting at home by myself. So I went to the La Brea Inn in, Tucson, or in Los Angeles, and I met Derek Taylor, who was one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. In what way? Um, a great sense of humor. He was a very distinguished man, a gentleman. Um, he looked a lot like Errol Flynn to me, very debonair. He was, um, he just had a, a way with words that I've never met anyone quite like that before or before or since then. And he didn't flaunt his relationship with the Beatles. He would say very casually, well, I got a letter from George. And that was it, you know. And he was just very down to earth. Uh, everyone loved him. Anyone who's ever met him will tell you that he was just pretty unique. Were you a Beatle girl? I was a Beatle girl. Who is your Beatle? My Beatle, well, I thought it, well, you know, I kind of just liked them as a group. I didn't really have this one Beatle. I thought the cutest was Paul. I was right, though, right? <laughs> we, uh, right. we have agreement? <laughs> uh, mostly. <laughs> Some, mostly, at that time. But I wasn't, you know, I just found the whole the whole Beatle thing so fascinating. You know, it was the hair, the clothes, the, the music. It was all fascinating. It was so different than anything I think that we had experienced in that time. So I was one of those people who, the minute the album would come out, I was there buying it and listening to it in my room. I confess that totally. So, you know, I was, it was pretty, um, I was the one who got to do it while the rest of you guys wished you were doing it. And so I'm now telling you about it because you deserve to have been there too. That magic call comes, so do you want to go to London and help out at Apple? Do you want to be a gopher? I mean, what was, what did he say? What, yeah, what did he say? What did so, he say? He said, you should come to London. Apple's just getting started and you'd be perfect. Now, I don't know what he meant by that. <laughs> I really, to this day, I don't know what he meant by that. But it must have been true because I stayed around for a long time. There's a quote here. If you don't mind, I did a little homework. Your quote was, it was like being let go at Disneyland when yeah, you got there. Right. It was, well, you know, imagine 1968... And they were still in a building on Wigmore Street, so Apple had really just opened. And it was just like any office building. It was on the fourth floor, 
and you walked in and there was this huge reception room and there were pictures all around of either a gold record or Beatles, you know, and there were doors off of it and every so often you'd see Paul walk out or every so often you'd see John and Yoko sitting in the lobby. So it was, you know, and it was really buzzing. I like to compare it to probably what like working for any of the the computer companies is today, you know? Like you're in, it was very young and it was exciting. Every day was exciting. Of the four, who did you meet first? Paul, typical, <laughs> huh? Right, hey, I'm Paul, right? <laughs> He, um, he came into, I was sitting in Derek's office, and he came into the next room, and Derek said, oh, it sounds like Paul's here. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but it was kind of like, oh, my God, you know? And then I heard his voice, and I had to put all that, that my brain had to really compute and put all that together that I was actually sitting on the other side of the wall from Paul McCartney. You know, it was just really kind of difficult to, to put that together at first. And then a few minutes later, he came in the room. And charming and lovely. And he was, because this was a weird time in their lives, too. I mean, you're coming into this picture as Brian's gone and they're setting up this company. And as many people have told us here on stage, Ken and Apple was, was sort of very dysfunctional as a company in many, many ways. Did you, is that fair to say? I don't think it was then, or maybe I was so dysfunctional, I just didn't notice, but, you know, I, I don't remember, I think it got dysfunctional as time went along, but compared to other places, it was pretty unusual. I mean, there was Richard DeLello, who was sitting in a room cutting out press clippings and pasting it into a book, and, you know, there was a, John and Yoko brought in a, a what was he? He was an I Ching or I Ching, as you would like to say, guy who came in to, and they would like, they would throw the I Ching with you to see if you were right for the company. So I don't know, maybe so, I was, I got lucky, but a few people did have to go. But maybe you would call that dysfunctional. I thought it was fun. Again, 1968, it's a different world. It's a different era. What were you told your responsibilities would be? Well, I didn't have a job at first. Um, Were you being paid? No. I had $100 in my pocket, and um, Derek put me up in a hotel after I stayed in a bed and breakfast. So I was, um, he kept putting me in different places. And then I realized if I'm going to really be able to stay here, I better get very creative. So I started off helping Richard with press clippings, and then I... I would help, if anybody left, I would take their place. So if the switchboard operator, Lori, had to go out for lunch, I would go do the switchboard. If somebody had to sit on reception, I would sit on reception. And then I got clever and realized that I could go out and get them these really cool lunches for all of the execs. And once I started doing that, Peter Asher started paying attention to me, and then he asked me to be his secretary. But that took probably two months. Okay, so you're feeling your way along, you're, you're kind of getting to get the, the lay of the land, so to speak, and how did you sort of connect to George Harrison the way you did? Um, well, that happened a little later. I mean, the, the third day, second or third day I was at Apple, Derek said, would you like to go to lunch? And I said, sure. And so George appeared, and apparently we were going to lunch with George. So that was about the third day of being at Apple. And we, we, took his, we rode in his car to a restaurant, and I had lunch with him and a journalist and Derek. And then, um, then they had the, the uh, it was the fashion show for the opening of a the Apple Boutique for Men. So that's the first time I got to, know, to really meet George. And then a little while later, he would start coming into the office more. But it took a while. I think we just connected. You know, I think that our sense of humor's matched and we're both Python. You know, just, we really, number not revolution, uh, number nine. And I actually did clap on that one. But I was so kind of just sort of stunned by the fact that they were in, I was in the studio with them that I, I don't remember the song too well. 
I can understand. Like suddenly you're there, and I'm in the studio being recorded for Beatle music. It's right. a bizarre. It's a leap that's like a, over a chasm. And Ringo comes into the picture. How? Ringo wasn't around very much. He was when I got there. He was working on movies. I think, what was the movie he was working on that, at that point? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Magical Christian. Yes. Magic Christian. Magic Christian. So he was out of the country, and John was just, was just with Yoko, so he was pretty into her. Paul was very into Apple at that time, and George was, I don't know what he was doing, but he didn't come in that often either, but Paul was in every single day, and John and Yoko were in most of the time. <laughs> but, you know, it's like Paul was the businessman in, of the Beatles. Somebody had to run it, as, to me, Mick Jagger was, which, if you don't mind, we'll get to some Stone stuff I in a little while. You're, you describe, uh, and by the way, her story is absolutely fascinating. It took you how long to finally write your story? Uh, about a hundred years. <laughs> I had to wait for people to kind of get old so they didn't care anymore. <laughs> Chris has written the most amazing book. I, you know, we, you always see these, th thank, you. thank you. We talk about page turners. For us, this is, there's nothing Stephen King could write that, that can equal your life and, and being part of this. And talking about this, the intimacy and, and being in this relationship between Ringo and Maureen and George and Patty and you're kind of in the middle of this merry-go-round. Yeah, and... You know, I think it's important to say, when I, when I joke about everybody getting older to write the story, I think it's important to say that we had a, you know, within that friendship and within that circle of people, there was an unspoken and sometimes spoken agreement that if you were in the intimates, in the inside circle of the Beatles, that you did not talk about it. You didn't talk about, talk to the press. You didn't tell people what you were experiencing because if you did, you were ostracized. It was that clear. Um, they trusted you. They had to trust you. And the circle was very small at that time. So there were, it take, I mean, Patty will be one to say it too. It took years for us to be able to feel that it would be okay to do that, to, to write, actually write our memoirs. I mean, it's, Patty was here uh, last year, as a matter of fact. It was just it, two, years. two years ago. It all just blends together. Thank you. Uh, it was what a remarkable time that I had talking with her about that era. And before you wrote it, did you call anyone? Did you say, hey, I'm writing a book? Is it okay? Did, did you check with anyone or did you just feel, well, the time's right? Well, I wouldn't ask anyone for their okay because now I'm old enough I can do what I want to do. Right, right, right. But, um, thank you. <laughs> but I did actually talk to Patty. She was the first person I think I told from that group of people. And her book had come out. And so I called her. And, and then I sent her an early copy because I wanted her to read it. So, you know, I let her know. But for a long time, that paranoia was there that I was afraid to sort of tell people I was writing the book for fear I would be ostracized, even now. That's not the reaction I've gotten, though. Good. There's a, a story that I've heard of early days, Friar Park, this 120-room mansion of George's that before there's any heat, any furniture. It, true story, you and Patty Boyd in sleeping bags <laughs> in this gigantic mansion alone? The day I arrived, the night I arrived, George came, called me up um, and said, do you want to come and live at Friar Park with us? Well, all right. What am I going to do? Say no? No. So I go, okay, so I get my bags, I meet him at the studio, and we drive out to Friar Park. It was pretty late at night after the session, and we walk, first of all, I thought the gatehouse was the main house. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the little house at the front of the That's drive. That's a great story. And I said, oh, it's so beautiful, George, and he thought that was hysterical, so. He thought you were taking the piss? Yeah, no, no, he thought, I, I guess he thought I was nuts. <laughs> So we drove on down, and then there was a middle lodge, and I went, is that it? And he said, no. And then we turned a corner, and there was this gothic mansion. I couldn't believe it. I felt like I, had, I was in a, a novel. It was unbelievable, this place. So we walked in the doors um, to this 
huge big room, which was the, called the main hall. And Patty kind of came out of one of the walls. It was later <laughs> I discovered a paneled door. She came out and we sat around and we talked and everything. And then finally I, they said, well, we're going to bed. And I said, great, where do I sleep? And they said, anywhere you want. There are 120 rooms, you can choose the one you want. And I said, well, what about sleeping? What, where are the beds? And they said, oh, we don't have beds. You'll have to sleep in a sleeping bag. And George and Patty slept on a mattress on the floor. So there was no central heating. So I chose the room right next to the main hall because that's the only place where I knew where I was. And I slept right on top of the gas burner because it's the only way I could keep warm. So that was, that's how it was for the, probably the first month. That's insane, but beautiful and brilliant and a memory that you'll never forget. No. Can you imagine being a 120-room floor in a sleeping bag? No, I, I can't. Now, as far as relationships go, with, did you, was your relationship with George, did it ever feel like it was going to be something more than friends? No. He was like a brother, and, and I really mean that. He and Patty were like a sister and brother. She was, it, it didn't take long for her and I to become best friends. And the interesting thing is that, you know, Patty, I had to learn really quickly about dealing with the women because the women didn't trust other women because the only women they ever saw were trying to take their husbands away one way or the other, you know? So, uh, you know, that was an agreement that we had right off the beginning is that wasn't going to be a part of our rela my relationship with George. So they became like a brother and sister, really. Same thing with Linda, with Paul? Um, you know, I didn't have the same as close relationship, but I, once I, I mean, I knew Paul before Linda came into the picture, so of course, <laughs> I didn't want her there, you know, because he was the only eligible Beatle, so, right? right? So I th sort of thought maybe I'd be next. Um, so I, I found out that I wasn't going to be able to get out past her, so we became friends too, but I didn't continue as close a relationship as I did with Patty and Maureen. This, we're not, this isn't, this interview is not going to be TMZ, this isn't like, as I, as I told Chris, it's not just a gossip session, but there's just one moment I, I want you to share because you've talked about it, of sitting at the table, Maureen Starkey, Ringo, George Harrison, and George telling Ringo, by the way, I'm in love with your wife. <sighs> Do you mind explaining how that goes? It was like your worst nightmare, you know? Because these are, were all my friends, and I had no, no clue whatsoever. I was going to spend Christmas in England with Patty and George, and Maureen said, no, come and stay with us, too. So I thought, okay, I'll stay Christmas with them and New Year's with, with Maureen and, and Ringo, because they had this great New Year's Eve party every year. And I had no clue. I was naive to the fact there was anything going on. And, and then I realized something was going on because George told me. Um, so that night, I was going to go over and see Maureen. And George said, well, I'll drive you. And Patty said, well, I'll go with you. And I thought, good girl. She's, take, she's taking care of things. So we drove over. But it was, we were just having drinks and talking. And, and then suddenly, George comes out with this, I love your wife. And the room was as still as you can possibly imagine. I mean, you could, it was just, nobody even had a breath. And Ringo just sat there and sort of played with his cigarette and then turned, and then looked at George and said, better you than someone we don't know. And I think if you, you have to understand what that meant. And, and I think it's important to know that, as I said, this was a really intimate circle of people. And they didn't trust outsiders. So even though it may have so sound weird today, it was with a lot of, we were all drinking and doing a certain amount of drugs back at that, t at that time. Everybody was pretty much in their late 20s and early 30s. And they trusted each other. So it was better him than someone we don't know. And it, I don't know if you can get that through, through your logic and reason, but it was true. You know, it, it makes sense in and of the time that where you can't go out, you're not, you can't go to a club, you can't go out to restaurants, you can't walk down the street, 
if these things are going to happen, it's only going to happen inside this tiny, small circle. And they were so close. Jeff Emmerich, their longtime engineer, had said, one-on-one, -on -one, I could discuss music with them. One-on-two, -on -two, George Martin and I, and, and two Beatles. If the four of them clumped together, it was one entity, and no one could get into that circle. If they had something to discuss, it was, if it was four, there was no one else in the room. And you realize how tight that circle was and how much they relied on each other through yeah. the years. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that, but, but that's, that's the way trust was back at that in those days. I want to jump ahead, if you don't mind, of how we go from the Beatles to the Rolling Stones. Do you once describe it, at least if the quote is right that I have, that you decide, cl claim that going to the Rolling Stones was like climbing down the ladder? Yes, and I don't think anyone will disagree with me, right? <laughs> well, maybe Philip Michael Jagger, but I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean in this room. Oh, I see, in this room, yeah. <laughs> it was. It was like the Beatles was the greatest band. The Beatles were the greatest band. Was the, right? Yes. The Beatles was. The Beatles was the greatest band. And the Stones were, were next. So I went kind of down. <laughs> did, and how did you wind, how did you go, hey, Apple blows up, these relationships are crazed, and you land in Rolling Stoneville in the most creative, crazy time that that band ever had. Oh, yeah. Um, I went back to L.A. after the Beatles, after I quit working at Apple and um, went to work for Peter Asher again in Los Angeles, who was then managing James Taylor and I think not quite Linda Ronstadt yet and, and a few others. So I was working for Peter and I got a call. It was great. I love Peter. To this day, he remains one of my best friends, but it was boring, you know, and boring doesn't work for me. So I get a call saying the Stones are looking for someone in Los Angeles. They're going to be here for six to months to a year. So I applied for the job, so to speak. And I knew Mick from Apple. So um, they hired me. And your role as a Stones confidant is they hired you to what? Personal assistant. I was their personal assistant. So I did... I mean, I got them houses in, in L.A. I um, went to Mick's house every day, and we did business and phones and went to parties and pretty much everything. They were working on Exile on Main Street at that time. So we, did, we worked on this, in the studio a lot. And then the 72 tour, which is like with the all-time tour ever. That's when I first... Got, saw the Stones, and it's something I'll never forget my whole life. Chris, by the way, is on the back cover of Exile on Main Street. That's you on the bottom, right? The, the mystery woman. So here it is this week, Exile on Main Street being remastered, remixed, coming out. We're just getting it at Q1043 and going to feature it. I still think it's one of the greatest albums ever made. And here, you know, that's, to me, one of their great masterpieces that lives on what do you, I mean, when you think back about the music and the, the stories, the tales of, you know, Keith's excesses, you know, Mick Taylor trying to, you know, sessions beginning at four in the morning and going all day, true or blown out of proportion? Totally true. It was, it was crazy. I mean, it was totally crazy. But you know what? It felt normal to me, which is kind of weird. But it was just normal. Every 